Welcome back to On The Road. In this video I was exploring the haunted Morris Jumal mansion. The history of this mansion began when Tory Lieutenant Colonel Roger Morris bought a 150-acre property at Harlem Heights in 1765 that stretched the width of Manhattan Island upon which to build his family's summer home. At the time, this was the rural country land outside of New York. He had just retired from the British Army in 1764 and wanted a summer place to escape the heat of the city. His dream summer home was completed in 1768. It was called Mount Morris. Unfortunately, the Morris family only enjoyed this home until 1776, when the Revolutionary War broke out. His family went to live with his wife's brother in Yonkers while he went back to England. He did come back in 1777 to take the job of inspector of the claims of refugees. However, in 1783, he and his family moved back to England permanently. Meanwhile, his good friend whom he served with, George Washington, under General Braddock during the French and Indian War, moved the Continental Headquarters into Mount Morris from September of 1776 to October 18, 1776. Washington moved his headquarters into the octagonal salon and used the three-room suite directly above as his private chambers. The mansion was located in a prime strategic location of Harlem Heights. After Washington moved on, the British moved inside. During the Battle of Fort Washington, Continental prisoners were quartered in the barn. General Sir Henry Clinton kept his summer headquarters in the mansion in 1778, as did General Nifos in the following years. The front hallway on the first floor is decorated in the 1820s French Empire style. The mansion's first family, the Morises, were loyalists and their properties were taken by the new American government after the war. General George Washington and military leaders occupied the home for six weeks during the Revolution. Later, the house was occupied by both British and Hessian troops, as indicated by the portrait on the wall of Hessian soldier Wilhelm von Hesse, c. 1770. The house was briefly used as a tavern until the Jumel family purchased the property in 1810. Many of the home's details are based on primary source documents, such as the gray and white temple wallpaper which draws inspiration from a description provided by Eliza Bowen Jumel, 1775-1865, in a letter to her French husband, Stephen Jumel, 1754-1832. If you are enjoying the video, give me a like, and don't forget to subscribe. Eliza Jumel and her grandchildren by Alcide Ercole, 1854. Madame Jumel and her grandchildren, Eliza Jumel Chase and William Inglis Chase, sat for this portrait while on a grand tour in Europe. A monumental journey to take at nearly 80 years old, Madame Jumel took her grandchildren to Italy, France, and England. While in France, Madame presented her granddaughter, who was then 17 years old, to the court of Louis Felipe. During this trip, Eliza Chase was also betrothed to Paul Guillaume Puri. The Morris Jumel Mansion is a house museum, with the rooms representing the various styles of the house's historic periods, Georgian, Federalist, French Empire, and Victorian. They also have interesting special displays to inform the public visitors. A lot of Madame Jumel's outstanding French Empire-style furniture that was donated by her descendants is on display. Some of this furniture was owned by Napoleon himself, who perhaps gifted it to her husband, French merchant Stephen Jumel. Other artifacts from its long, important history are also on display. Through architecture and a diverse collection of decorative arts objects, each room of the Morris Jumel mansion reveals a specific aspect of its colorful history from the 18th through the 19th centuries. After the war, the mansion was owned by several owners. At some point in time, it became a commercial endeavor, a tavern called Calumet Hall. By 1810, Mount Morris had become a fixer-upper opportunity, but French merchant turned real estate salesman Stephen and New York native Eliza Jumel saw the possibilities and decided they could renovate to make it their own. They modernized their forever home by renovating it in the federal and French Empire styles. It was at this time that the original double doors of the front entrance were replaced by a single door framed by two atom-like sidelights surmounted by a fan-like transom. Similarly in the octagonal salon, an empire chimney piece and brass grates were installed. If you are enjoying the video, give me a like and don't forget to subscribe. Take a closer look, French cloud wallpaper. In 1826, Eliza Jumel wrote to her husband Stephen requesting him to purchase rolls of cloud wallpaper for the octagon room while he was traveling in France. Today's wallpaper is based upon a circa 1815 paper design found in the archival collections of the Musée des Arts Décoratifs in Paris. The mansion worked together with Atelier Dofford to recreate this pattern, using hand-carved wooden blocks.
Here one of the three chimneys. Two chimneys are in the central part of the mansion, on the east and west sides of the main section of the mansion. The third chimney can be found on the rear wall of the octagon wing. After Stephen Jumel's demise, his wife Eliza tried marriage again to Aaron Burr, but it didn't last. She lived there until she died in her 90s in 1865. After she died, control over the house and her estate were contested in court for 17 years. I wonder how much maintenance work was done on the mansion during this uncertain time of ownership. The winners of this long court battle were the original family of Lt. Col. Morse. For the next 38 years, Mount Morris was passed along to several Morris family descendants until it became a creaky fixer-upper opportunity that would take a boatload of money to restore. Duncan Fife Suite, 1825. Duncan Fife, 1768-1854, was a famous furniture maker in early 19th century New York. This red sofa is one of the original pieces of furniture commissioned by Eliza Jumel during her redecoration of the mansion in 1825-1826. The partial suite of 12 chairs, pier tables, and sofa reflects the French Empire or neoclassical style that was popular in the early 1800s. Hessians for good measure during the Revolutionary War, after the departure of both General Washington and British troops, a group of Hessians, led by Officer Wilhelm von Neufossen, arrived and established their headquarters here. This portrait, gifted to the mansion by the Romanov Caviar Company, depicts Colonel von Hess, another commander of the Hessian troops. Take note of the inscription on the frame, WIXLZH stands for Wilhelm der Neunten, Landgraf zur Hessen, William IX, Count of the Hessians with X standings as the Roman numeral 9. The basement houses the colonial-era kitchen and tells the story of domestic servitude at the mansion. The room features the original hearth and a beehive oven as well as a collection of early American cooking utensils. Cool during the hot summer months and cold in the winter months. Hopefully, the fireplaces were also there from the main chimneys. The city did rise to the occasion probably because Washington had used it as his headquarters briefly. Ferdinand and Lily Earle, who was related to the original Morris family, sold Mount Morris and its surrounding two acres to New York. The Daughters of the American Revolution went a step further. Four local chapters of the Daughters of the American Revolution formed the Washington Headquarters Association, and the Mount Morris was turned into a historic house dedicated to Washington and the Revolutionary War. It became the Morris Jumel Mansion Museum. The first public celebration of Washington's birthday by the city of New York was held here in 1905. The public enjoyed the grounds and touring the inside as well. Other events were held here as well throughout the years. The jewel in the crown of Sugar Hill received further protection and recognition. The Landmarks Preservation Commission designated the Morris Jumel Mansion as an individual landmark in 1967 and an interior landmark in 1975, and the mansion was listed in the National Register of Historic Places in 1966. The mansion is a member of the Historic House Trust of New York City. Ah of 2020, stories of black Americans who had ties to Morris Jumel Mansion are being shared at the museum as well. On display are the experiences of enslaved people who worked for the Morris family, William Lee who was George Washington's enslaved valet, and freedwoman, Anne Northup, who worked as Eliza Jumel's cook as she fought to repatriate her husband, Solomon, from bondage. Solomon's harrowing story is retold in his memoir, 12 Years a Slave. Did you know? Did you know this is the room? The building's longest resident, Eliza Jumel, married Vice President Aaron Burr, 1756 to 1836. Eliza Jumel married Aaron Burr, a Revolutionary War veteran and former Vice President under Thomas Jefferson, in July 1833, here in the French parlor. It was a second marriage for both parties and interpreted today as one of convenience, where wealth and social status took precedence over love. By the time of their marriage, Burr had survived several scandals, personal tragedies, and financial reversals. In yet another historical coincidence, Burr died on the very day the divorce was to be finalized in 1836. In her later years, Eliza styled herself as the widow of the former vice president of the United States when traveling in Europe. Who slept here? For centuries, Americans have been fascinated by where George Washington would have slept. 
while occupying the house from September 15, 1776, until October 21, 1776, Washington probably occupied one of the bedrooms on the second floor, likely the one to the south of this room. Recent scholarship and inquiry have informed our understanding that William Lee, the enslaved valet or manservant of General Washington, must have also slept nearby. Scholarship notes that he rarely left Washington's side and frequently slept in a cot outside of his room. Perhaps, while at the Morris Jumel mansion, Lee would have slept in one of the two smaller bedrooms on this floor. The inquiry has informed our understanding that William Lee, the enslaved valet or manservant of General Washington, must have also that he rarely left Washington's side and frequently slept in a cot outside of his room. Perhaps, while at the Morris Jumel mansion, Lee would have slept in one of the two smaller bedrooms on this floor, like this one, which is now an office. Did you know that General George Washington used this room as his office for five weeks during the American Revolution? At the time, the home's high elevation and the 270 of windows provided sweeping views of the island of Manhattan, Brooklyn, Staten Island, and New Jersey. The Morris Jumel Mansion is a rich tapestry of history and haunting, carefully embroidered over time, the needle of tragedy leaving pinpricks of blood on the centuries-old fabric. Individual panels have been created by each family, each life-changing event and historic moment, deftly stitched together as one seamless artifact. It is, however, not a museum piece to hide behind glass and velvet rope. This Manhattan landmark is to be touched, experienced, and enjoyed. The intricacies and enigmas of those who lived and died within are to be discovered, sensed, and embraced. From the moment Colonel Roger Morris made the first stitch, to the major design of Eliza, it is a tapestry to not have ended, a continuous thread. The caretakers of historic importance since it became a part of New York heritage, such as our host, Chris Devalis, add their own stitches, custodians of a place outside of time and space, a resplendent eye in the storm of one of the busiest cities on this earthly realm. Transformation in the mansion's window treatments occurred sometime before World War II, as is shown in a photograph from 1936. The blinds are still those recorded in the 1903 postcard, or at minimum close copies, but a metal shutter dog has been installed on either side of each window to hold the blinds open. As a result, they have the appearance of shutters that are meant to be left open as a decorative element of the facade, rather than blinds adjusted over the course of the day to modulate the lighting of the interior. Today, of course, the house has neither shutters nor blinds. It remains to be seen whether either Mary appear at some future time. But at least I feel better prepared to answer when the next visitor inquires about the mysterious shutter dogs that protrude from Eliza Jumel's historic former home. The furnishings and decor of this room were chosen to reflect the styles and tastes in fashion during the time that Aaron Burr was associated with the mansion during 1833. By the 1830s, the new technology of the Industrial Revolution had begun to change the appearance of homes. Carpeting became more affordable, as did textiles used for curtains and bed hangings. Wallpaper continued to be popular throughout the 19th century. Furniture became heavier, and elaborately carved surfaces replaced the lighter inlet ornament of the federal period. Aaron Burr, Revolutionary War hero and third vice president of the United States, married Eliza Jumel in 1833. By the time of their marriage, Burr, who was 77 years old, had survived personal tragedies, scandals, financial reversals and was practicing law in New York City. Eliza began divorce proceedings one year after the wedding. Burr died in 1836, on the day the divorce was granted. Although the marriage only lasted a short time, and Eliza resumed the use of Stephen Jumel's name after the divorce, she used Burr's name when traveling in Europe in 1854 to enhance her social status early mid-19th century. The stained glass panels were installed by the Jumels. Construction techniques revealed the stained glass could have only been made by two London firms that exported stained glass to America at the turn of the 19th century. Recent conservation treatment by the Brooklyn Stained Glass Restoration Studio has stabilized the fragile glass panels. Paranormal Investigation Morris Jumel Mansion. Carol Ward, the executive director of the mansion then noted there tends to be more activity during events renovations. In the last week, portraits had been moved for an upcoming renovation. 
Carol said there tends to be more paranormal activity when she's around. She's been working at the mansion for eight years, and she's the first female executive director of the mansion, and many believe that Eliza had feminist leanings, considering the way in which she'd managed to expand Stephen Jumel's fortune and hold on to it, in spite of being a woman. There have been other recent investigations at the mansion by outside groups, but they found little activity. Carol talked about some of her ghostly experiences in the mansion, for example, recently when a television crew was visiting the mansion, Carol heard a voice ask if everything was okay, but she could find no one in the near vicinity. Manifestations. Ex-husbands unite. Visitors have felt the presence of Madame Jumel's angry first husband, Stephen, and her second husband, Aaron Burr, the one-term vice president of the United States who was slandered by Alexander Hamilton. He would up killing him in a duel. Stephen was stuck here because he was still angry and couldn't rest because of the actions of his murderous wife, Madame Eliza Jumel. Aaron Burr had the sense to realize what kind of woman he was married to and divorced her before she could kill him too. He still likes his home, however. Perhaps he was trying to comfort Stephen. A rash choice. The apparition of a young, servant girl, in great distress, has been seen on the top floor where the servants' quarters were located. She had jumped out the window to her death after becoming romantically involved with one of the members of the family. Still on duty. An enthusiastic, history-loving children's teacher who had bounded up the stairs to the top floor, eager to see the mansion from top to bottom. He fainted in fright when confronted by the ghost of a revolutionary soldier who had stepped out of a painting, apparently still providing security for Washington. This soldier was seen on another occasion by another teacher as well. Fear can kill here. Another teacher with a heart condition had a fatal heart attack after seeing an apparition. Hans Holzer advises that ghosts don't hurt people and people shouldn't be afraid of them because they are just beings in trouble with themselves. The Morris Jumel Mansion is considered one of the most haunted places in New York City. It has been the subject of paranormal investigations on television shows like The Holzer Files and Ghost Adventures and has been featured on The Today Show. Famous paranormal academics and investigators such as Hans Holzer, Zach Bagans, and the Tennessee Wraith Chazers have all visited the site to try and communicate with former residents. People have claimed to see apparitions of all sorts in the mansion, from Hessian soldiers and George Washington to Eliza Jumel and Aaron Burr. Are you brave enough to hunt for ghosts yourself? You can join a paranormal historical investigation at the mansion. Listen to one of the many stories that the mansion has. There was a rumor that in the 1970s, I think, there was a group of students, you know, because we have a lot of students here, now, because I'm going to rent it, and they were waiting for the, um, for the educator who was running late like I did today. <laughs> so they were in the front and they were making a little bit of noise. All of a sudden, they looked up with that balcony was, and when I'm ahead, but the young negro saw that, they said, shh, and they said, shh, and they said, shh, while that's happening, the educator runs to the back of the side door and she comes in and she takes her jacket and she opens the door. She's like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm so late, guys, come in. So the class come in and they're like, hi. And they're like, well, who is the lady of this? And she's like, no, I'm opening the house. It's just me. And they're like, no, it was a lady dressed in black. And then they walk in and there's a big quadro of Eliza and they're like, it was black. 